In mid-September 2000, a Russian cargo ship on passage from Riga, Latvia to Poole, UK, with a cargo of sawn timber and bundles of pallet timber, was about 70 miles north-northwest of the Hook of Holland in the southern North Sea. A seaman who was working in the forecastle went aft, saying he was going to the bathroom. About 15 or 20 minutes later, the boatswain, who was also working forward, also went aft. As he passed down the port side of number two hold, he noticed the deck cargo tarpaulin lashings were undone and the tarpaulin had been lifted back. He looked closer and found the hatch cover to number two hold access shaft wedged open. At the bottom of the shaft, he saw the first seaman's body. The boatswain immediately raised the alarm and called for assistance. When help arrived, the boatswain donned a self-contained breathing apparatus and entered the shaft with other crew members supporting his efforts from outside the shaft. The seaman was removed to deck, but despite prolonged attempts at resuscitation, he could not be revived. When the ship arrived in Poole, the police and the British Marine Accident Investigation Branch investigated the incident. Before cargo operations were commenced, atmospheric tests were taken on the access shaft where the seamen had been found. Very low levels of oxygen, together with high levels of carbon monoxide, were recorded. With police, fire brigade and customs officials in attendance, the deck cargo was removed and the holes were opened. Apart from a distinctive smell, there was no evidence of fire or any chemical reaction, either in the access shaft or in the cargo itself. There were no technical or operational reasons for the seaman to have entered the shaft. He had not been instructed to do so by the boatswain or by any officer on board. It was concluded that he had made a personal decision to enter and for an unknown reason. The cause of death was most probably due to the low oxygen and high carbon monoxide levels present in the access shaft to number two hold at the time the victim entered the space. Timber cargoes are a recognized source of oxygen depletion and carbon monoxide generation in enclosed spaces. On the 22nd of July 1991, the Netherlands flag livestock vessel Zebu Express was lying at anchor in Darwin Harbour. The master and second officer had gone ashore and the chief officer was in temporary charge. As work started in the morning, the chief engineer and second engineer began working in the bow thruster compartment, cleaning the electrical motor. There had been a small water leak, and the motor had got wet. Early in the afternoon, the chief engineer observed the second engineer to be in physical difficulty in the lower part of the compartment. He climbed out onto the deck, raised the alarm, and then returned inside to assist the second engineer, descending to the lower compartment without a breathing apparatus. Both the chief engineer and the second engineer collapsed in the lower part of the bow thruster compartment. Attempts to rescue the two men were made by the assistant engineer wearing a self-contained compressed air breathing apparatus and supported by other members of the crew on deck, but he was unable to effect a rescue. The bodies of the chief engineer and second engineer were eventually recovered from the bow thruster compartment by members of the Darwin Fire Service. A surveyor of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority conducted an investigation into the incident under the provisions of the Navigation Act. The deaths of the two engineers resulted from their failure to follow the well-publicized safety procedures for safe entry into and rescue from enclosed spaces. The second engineer died of asphyxia being overcome by accumulated toxic vapours from the electrical cleaner being used in a confined, enclosed space without adequate ventilation. The chief engineer likewise died from asphyxia from the vapours, but this would not have happened if he had recognised the hazards and donned breathing apparatus. The 12,573 gross registered tonnes US flag tanker William T. Steele was preparing to load a cargo of benzene at Guayanilla, Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, due to a planning oversight in the manifold rigging, the cargo was inadvertently loaded into the wrong tank, number 9 centre. 
which had been reserved for a cargo of xylene. There was no chance of working with the wrong stowage, so the benzene was transferred out, and number nine centre was washed and ventilated. Two crewmen entered the forward end of number nine centre to insert an isolation blank in a flange in a pipeline, and the chief officer went to the after part of the tank to eject water from the sump area. The two crewmen working forward were unaware of the presence of the chief officer. When the flanges in the line were cracked, benzene began to leak out, and the fumes forced the two crewmen to leave the compartment without completing their task. Once on deck, one of the crewmen looked back down into the tank and saw the chief officer lying in the bottom. The alarm was raised, and the second officer and several other crewmen entered the space without breathing apparatus to rescue the chief officer. By this time, the master had arrived on deck, and he donned a breathing apparatus and followed the others into the tank. When he reached the second officer some way down into the tank, he noticed that he was experiencing difficulty in breathing, and attempted to share his air supply. As he tried to pass the mask over, both men fell the remaining distance to the bottom of the tank. Seeing this, the other crewmen immediately exited the tank. They survived. But all three officers died. The subsequent investigation by the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board concluded that both the chief officer and second officer died from prolonged exposure to the highly concentrated benzene vapors, and the master died from the same cause, but also possibly due to injuries sustained in the fall. This incident occurred on a tweened deck dry cargo vessel. Which was fitted with several deep tanks designed for the carriage of vegetable oil cargoes. She was on a return run to Europe, having called at various small island ports in the South Pacific, where she had loaded palm oil in several of the deep tanks. Access trunks led from the main deck on each side between number one and number two hatches to lobbies at tween deck level. In each lobby. There was a bolted manhole cover at the top of the appropriate deep tank. The deep tanks were protectively coated and fitted with stainless steel heating coils to maintain the cargo temperature during the voyage and to raise it prior to discharge. The palm oil was discharged in Hull, England, and the tanks were subsequently ballasted with seawater for the next passage to the South Pacific. No cleaning was done after the discharge of the palm oil. And the ballast was loaded directly on top of the remaining palm oil residue. Some ten to twelve days into the voyage, a crewman was taking routine tank soundings, when he noticed a bad smell emanating from the sounding pipes for number two and number three deep tanks. This was not unusual, and regarded as a normal feature of the carriage of ballast water in these tanks. But he did report the matter to the chief officer. Following company requirements, the ballast water was changed after passing through the Panama Canal. Deballasting commenced during the afternoon of the second of October. During the evening watch the same day, the two engineer cadets were sent forward by the second engineer to check on the water levels in number two and number three tanks, as the ballast pump had lost suction. The cadets first checked number two tank by going down the access trunk to the tween deck level. And opening a steel screw-down inspection port in the manhole lid, having established that the ballast seemed to be out, they re-emerged and opened the door of the access trunk to number three tank and the pump room. Here they found a foul smell of such strength that they decided it was unsafe to enter, and reported back to the second engineer. On the assumption that all the ballast water was out, both tanks were re-ballasted with clean seawater. After reballasting, however, the smell from the air pipes of both tanks did not improve. A fleet circular from the company drew attention to the possible dangers of hydrogen sulfide gas evolving from decomposing palm oil in ballast water, and requesting masters to ensure that ballast water is changed at sea, and that under no circumstances was access to the tanks or pump rooms to be allowed. Until entry procedures had been followed 
and an entry permit issued. The circular had reportedly been discussed on board at a recent safety meeting, but this had not been minuted. A number of tanks were emptied and cleaned as the passage progressed. On the morning of the 21st of October, the chief officer asked the second engineer to pump the ballast out of number two and number three tanks. Two seamen were instructed to remove the lids from the tanks in the tween deck lobbies. At about 0700 hours, the Bangladeshi deck sarang reported to the bridge to discuss the work for that day. The chief officer anticipated that the two tanks would be empty by early afternoon and discussed preparations for tank cleaning with the sarang. There was evidently some confusion, however, and it is possible that the deck sarang had misunderstood when the tanks would actually be empty. When they turned to at 0800 hours, the deck sarang went forward with five men to the tank access trunks. They rigged a hose and prepared a cargo cluster light. The deck sarang and one seaman went down the access trunk at the starboard side leading to the tween deck lobby where the manhole access to number three deep tank had been opened earlier. The deck sarang entered the tank. Almost immediately, the seaman at the manhole shouted up the access trunk, Sarang fall down! He then entered the tank himself, and the other men on deck heard him calling, Sarang! Sarang! from inside the tank. Then it went quiet. At around 0850 hours, the third officer on watch on the bridge heard shouting on the deck. At the same time, another seaman alerted the chief officer and he ran forward. He issued instructions for self-contained breathing apparatus to be brought from the safety locker. Without waiting for it to arrive, however, he also entered the trunk. He was wearing a boiler suit, but no self-contained breathing apparatus, and had not stopped to put boots on. A seaman also went in, but only got a little way and came back out on deck due to the strong smell of gas. A few moments later, the master arrived, closely followed by a seaman bringing a self-contained breathing apparatus. The master donned the breathing apparatus and descended to the tween deck level, where he found the hose and cargo cluster which had been rigged earlier. He saw the chief officer slumped on a stringer plate below the manhole, but could not see the others. He considered that he was unable to assist on his own, and returned to the deck. The chief engineer and second engineer had now arrived on the scene and also donned self-contained breathing apparatus sets. They entered and descended with an emergency oxygen supply. They located the chief officer and started to administer the oxygen. As the chief engineer lifted the chief officer to a more upright position, he noticed another man hanging upside down from the stringer plate with one leg caught in the ladder. Later identified as the sarang. A stretcher was lowered, but put aside by the two engineers as being ineffective in the circumstances. Shortly after this, a self-contained breathing apparatus low-level alarm sounded, but the two engineers were unable to identify which set it was coming from. They decided it was safest for both of them to exit, and by the time they reached the deck, both alarms were sounding. Spare bottles had been organized by the master, and the chief engineer, this time accompanied by the second officer, returned inside wearing fresh sets. The second engineer went to get still more cylinders. The chief engineer took a line with him that was rigged through a block at the top of the access trunk. He attached it to the chief officer, and an attempt was made by those on deck to lift him out. The line, intended for lowering tools, was not strong enough, and parted, the chief officer falling back down and landing on a stringer plate. The chief engineer secured the line a second time, but then had to exit the space due to a low-level alarm sounding on his second set of bottles. A third fresh supply was provided, and the chief engineer again returned to the bottom of the trunk. This time he took a lifeline with him and secured that as well. The chief officer was eventually lifted out onto deck at around 1000 hours.
resuscitation and cardiac massage were attempted by the master and purser, but were abandoned when it became apparent that there was no sign of life. As there was no chance of the deck sarong or the seaman inside the tank being alive, the master decided not to risk further personnel, and ordered that deballasting should continue, with a view to recovering the other bodies when the tank was empty. The mixture of palm oil residues and salt water had led to the generation of hydrogen sulfide gas and corresponding oxygen depletion within the deep tank and in the vicinity of the tween deck lobby after removal of the manhole lid, which claimed the lives of the chief officer, the deck serang, and the seaman. The Hong Kong registered bulk carrier Nigo Kim arrived off the port of Dampier in the early hours of Saturday, the seventeenth of November, two thousand and one and anchored to await berthing instructions. She remained at anchor over the weekend, during which time the crew continued scheduled maintenance work, including the preparation of the interior of number one port topside ballast tank for painting. At about 1300 hours on Sunday, the chief officer tested the atmosphere inside the tank for oxygen content, in accordance with standard enclosed space entry procedures. At about 14.30 hours, the eight-man deck crew started work painting the steelwork inside the tank. One man was using an airless spray painting gun, while the other crewmen maintained the paint reservoir, tended a cargo light lowered through the after manhole, and generally assisted the painter as required. Ventilation of the tank was achieved by an open-ended compressed air hose led from the forecastle along the deck and down through this after manhole, and an electrically driven fan, positioned at an angle over the after manhole, which also provided access for the paint hose, light cable, and a lanyard. The chief officer supervised the initial stages of the task. The paint used was a two-part epoxy mix, thinned as needed using the thinner product supplied by the paint manufacturer. According to the chief officer, the volume of thinner used was between 30% and 50% of the total mixture. At about 15.30 hours, the chief officer went to the bridge to start his anchor watch, leaving the bosun and deck fitter in charge at the tank. At about 16.40 hours, a large explosion ripped through the tank. Three men were blown down the length of the main deck, killing them all instantly. Four others were blown over the side. One man, who had been inside the tank, was still alive but severely burned. He was assisted out of the tank through the ruptured main deck plating and airlifted ashore, but later died from his injuries. A search and rescue operation recovered the body of one seaman, but the others were never found. The investigation concluded that the air vapour ratio, in particular stemming from the paint thinner, had developed into an explosive atmosphere, and that it had come into contact with a source of ignition. It was unable to positively identify that source, other than to say it was within the compartment. The electrical lighting, a VHF radio, or a spark carried down from the electric fan could all have been possibilities, as could a falling tool or a cigarette lighter. It was noted that the prevailing good weather conditions would have increased the temperature inside the tank to around 38 degrees Celsius, which was above the ignition temperature of the thinners, although below the auto-ignition temperature. Analysis of the rate of delivery of fresh air revealed that it was insufficient to prevent the atmosphere entering the flammable range, and that, not being fitted with a trunking to carry the air to the lower part of the space, only the upper region of the tank was being ventilated. On the 4th of September 2001, the chemical tanker Rheinstern was anchored off Rotterdam awaiting cargo orders. Even though there were no instructions, the master decided to prepare the tanks anyway. The previous cargo had been naphtha. Because of the vapour density of the product, the plan was to ventilate the tanks and then eject the cargo residues, collecting them in a slop tank. No water cleaning was planned. Ventilation was achieved by a flexible large-bore trunking connected to the deck ventilation line 
and inserted through an adjacent tank cleaning hatch. The trunking was only pushed inside the top of the tank and not lowered down to the bottom. The tank lid was kept only cracked open in order to create a slight back pressure in the space. In order to eject the tanks, the normal procedure was for a man to enter the tank and put the ejector pump suction hose into the sump, directly under the foot of the deep well cargo pump. The first tank to be ejected was number 8 starboard, and the chief officer tested the atmosphere at around 10.30 hours, recording 15-25% to LEL and 20% oxygen content. The chief officer had given instructions that self-contained breathing apparatus was to be used in the tank entry, but he later observed a number of the crew exiting tank number 8 starboard after ejecting wearing filter masks. The chief officer spoke to one of the men who stated that they preferred to use the filter masks because the SCBA sets were heavy and awkward to use. Work continued through the day and the chief officer later left the deck to get some rest. At around 16.35 hours, the crew turned their attention to tank number 6 port. The tank was not tested before entry, the assumption being made that conditions would be the same as in number 8 starboard. The deck cadet had by now arrived on deck and was assigned as watchman. Three crewmen went into the tank, one to place and tend the suction hose, and two to squeegee, or sweep, any remaining product towards the sump. At around 16.45 hours, the deck cadet saw one of the men down the tank collapse. He immediately informed the second officer on the bridge, and the general alarm was sounded. The master quickly appeared on the bridge, but, discovering the situation, he went down onto deck straight away. On the way, he met the third officer and instructed him to collect a rescue line and harness from the after-deck store. Meanwhile, one of the two crew members still standing in tank number six, port, left the tank to get a breathing apparatus, while the other crew member stayed with the man who had collapsed. As the man arrived on deck, the deck cadet took the filter mask from him, put it on, and entered the tank himself to take a breathing apparatus set down. Once he had handed it over, he returned to the deck. The man who had stayed inside fitted the mask to the casualty and opened the air supply valve, establishing at the same time that he was breathing. The crewman who had left the tank now returned wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus and took over from his shipmate, who had been wearing only a filter mask throughout the incident. As he exited the tank, the master took the filter mask from him, put it on, and entered the tank. He tried to move the collapsed man, but he found him too heavy, gave up the attempt, and climbed back out onto deck. By this time, both equipment and men had started to arrive on scene, including the harness, line, and a resuscitator. Two more men donned self-contained breathing apparatus and went down inside the tank. The harness was lowered and fitted to the casualty, who was then hauled out onto deck. During this recovery operation, the master collapsed on deck. The second officer contacted the Netherlands Coast Guard from the bridge and requested medical assistance. After some discussion, it was agreed that the Rheinstern should heave anchor and proceed towards the entrance to the port, in order to minimise further delays, and a helicopter would be mobilised. In the meantime, repeated and prolonged attempts were made to revive the master, and care was administered to the man who had been brought out of the tank. At 18.30 hours, the helicopter arrived, bringing a doctor. The master was pronounced dead at the scene. The man who had collapsed in the tank spent the night in hospital ashore, but returned to the vessel the following day. It is standard practice that shore personnel usually want to start working a ship as soon as it comes alongside. This situation has been somewhat controlled since the introduction of security practices in recent years. The vessel in this incident had loaded a cargo of round wood logs in West Africa and arrived to discharge them in a port in southern Spain. The holes had remained shut due to poor weather in the Atlantic, and no ventilation had been carried out. As soon as she was alongside, 
the crew of shoreside stevedores were on board to commence work. The ship's deck crew began opening the hatch to hold number two, and a number of stevedores were seen to enter down the access ladder at the after end of the hold. On reaching the top layer of the cargo, one man was seen to slip and fall into a gap between two large logs. Seeing him drop, three of his colleagues rushed to the spot and attempted to rescue him. They too collapsed, one of them also slipping down into the gap. The second officer, who was watching from the deck above, raised the alarm, and the port safety officials and local fire brigades soon arrived. The problem of rescue. Was compounded by the added risk of movement of the cargo, if any one log was moved to gain access to the casualties underneath. Two men were recovered relatively quickly, but surrounding logs had to be secured in place, and several pieces of timber lifted carefully clear to get to the others. One man had fallen down between the logs to a depth of around 3.5 meters. It took almost an hour to bring all four men out of the hold. And all were declared dead on arrival at hospital. Logs where the bark has been stripped off are known to be dangerously slippery. Freshly cut logs are also known to deplete oxygen in enclosed spaces, and the hold had not been ventilated. These two factors contributed to the deaths of the four men. The Sapphire was a chemical tanker of fourteen thousand and two deadweight tons. Built in 1997, she had loaded 16 parcels of chemical products at U.S. Gulf ports, two being discharged at two ports in Turkey, and the remainder for discharge in Haifa, Israel. The ship sailed from Ambali in Turkey on the afternoon of the 23rd of April 1999, bound for Haifa. After clearing the port, it was planned to clean Number Two Center Tank, which had contained linear alkyl benzene. And number six center tank that had contained HMD, hexamethylene diamine solid. Number six center had been purged with nitrogen prior to loading in the U.S. Gulf. Although now diluted, the tank still contained a mixture of nitrogen and air, and a nitrogen tag was attached to the lid. The cleaning plan was discussed between the master, chief officer, and the pump man. And involved machine washing both tanks for 45 minutes with salt water, followed by a 20-minute fresh water rinse, then leaving them venting overnight, prior to mopping the next morning. The washing was carried out by the pump man and three crew members from 16:45 hours until dinner at 1800 hours. Over the meal, the pump man dismissed the sailors who had been assisting with the operation, and then returned to the deck with the crew boy. To rig the ventilation equipment. At approximately 19:50 hours, the chief officer was doing his deck rounds, and noticed that the lid on number six center tank was fully open. This was unusual, as the lid was normally just cracked during venting to keep a slight overpressure in the tank. Looking inside, he saw the deck boy lying on the first platform of the access ladder. Approximately four meters down into the tank, he was wearing a filter mask, was lying partly on his back, and slumped against the rails. The pump man was further inside the tank, and slumped over the top safety hoop on the next ladder down, with only his feet being trapped under the platform, stopping him falling to the tank bottom. He immediately ran aft, trying to raise the attention of the bridge personnel by waving his torch. The officers and crew's recreation rooms were just inside the accommodation door, and the chief officer summoned all personnel present, returning to deck without actually setting off any general alarm signal. Breathing apparatus and other equipment was quickly gathered and brought to the hatch of number six center tank. The chief officer was the first person to enter the tank. But only wearing an emergency escape breathing device that he had collected from the manifold safety store, he tried to lift the deck boy, but this was not possible. Though he did check for a pulse, he could not detect anything. At this time, the third engineer, who had taken a self-contained breathing apparatus from the CO2 room station aft, entered the tank to assist. Unfortunately, 
the chief officer's low-pressure alarm now went off, and he had to exit the tank. The third engineer momentarily came out to collect a safety harness and rope to attach to the deck boy, and the second engineer, who was also by now equipped in an SCBA, entered the tank with him. The restricted location of the casualties was proving a problem for the would-be rescuers, and it was obvious that there was not enough room for them all. So the second engineer left to assist from outside. The third engineer attached the harness and the rope around the deck boy, and he was lifted out by the crew on deck. The rope was then transferred to the pump man, and he was also pulled to the deck, with one man guiding the body from below. Attempts were made to revive both of the casualties, but without success. The experience of the pump man, the presence of a nitrogen tag on the lid, and the rigging of the ventilation equipment all point to the pump man understanding that the atmosphere inside the tank was hazardous. The deck boy had only been on board for a month, and it is reasonable to assume that he simply followed the more senior man. This ship was a 9,695 deadweight tons chemical tanker. At the time of the incident, she was engaged in tank cleaning following discharge of a cargo of ethylene dichloride. The centre tanks were stainless steel, and the wing tanks had a zinc silicate coating. The pump man and a sailor were running the machine cleaning, and the boatswain was following behind with another sailor, starting ventilation fans as the washing finished, and then ejecting the remaining washing water from the after ends of the tanks. The first two tanks were tested by the chief officer, but he then went to attend to planning for the next cargo, leaving the subsequent testing in the hands of the boatswain who had received training in the use of testing equipment and was approved as an operator under the vessel's safety management system. Tank number 4 centre port was tested and 21% oxygen was found. No evidence of toxic gas was noted. A green safe for entry tank was fitted to the lid and the appropriate entry permit was filled out, although it was added to a folder of permits without the chief officer's verification signature being obtained at that time. The boatswain entered the tank, climbing down the access ladder while the sailor lowered the suction hose from the ejector pump through a cleaning hatch above the sump. He did not wear any breathing apparatus or carry an emergency escape breathing device with him. At the time, the sea was calm and the vessel had a considerable stern trim and a slight list, so quite a lot of water was lying in the outboard after corner of the tank. The boatswain commenced removing this water, holding the suction pipe at a slight angle to maintain the suction. After approximately two minutes, and with around half of the water removed, he got a sudden blast of cargo vapour full in the face. He immediately dropped the ejector hose and ran towards the ladder. Catching his breath, and with eyes watering, he climbed out of the tank, more by feeling his way from rung to rung than anything else. The sailor on deck had seen the boatswain running away, and already raised the alarm through his radio to the bridge. The chief officer had also heard the broadcast, and was already halfway up the deck, as the boatswain emerged through the hatch. The boatswain vomited over the side, and then sat down, gradually recovering over the next 15 minutes or so. The chief officer tested the atmosphere in the tank for the record, but the ventilation fan had already stirred up the vapour to a noticeable level anyway. It was found that the cargo residue, being of a greater density, had settled beneath a layer of water in the corner of the tank. As the water was removed by the ejector, the product was exposed and the vapours were released. The metre readings obtained before entry were correct because the cargo residue was effectively contained by the water and the air above had been successfully purified by the ventilation fan. The boatswain was not aware of the risk of cargo remaining and simply trusted the metre readings. He did react when the conditions changed, but was lucky to escape from the tank without serious injury. This incident involves a chemical tanker which had stainless steel centre tanks, with coated wing tanks on either side. Her crew was comprised of men of several nationalities. The ship was in ballast and had just finished cleaning tanks.
They were in the final stages of mopping and drying in preparation for the next cargo. The chief officer, who had been on deck throughout, was closely supervising the operation, although the details of the enclosed space entry permits are not available. The tanks had, however, already been gas-freed the previous day, and the deck crew had been inside for ejecting and mopping. The chief officer had also been inside all of them for inspection. On the day of the incident, the deck crew was divided into two teams of two seamen each, in order to speed up the final preparations. It eventually became a practice that they went in and out of the tanks with minimal supervision by the chief officer or attendants from the deck. The afternoon coffee break came, and the deck was suddenly deserted. The officer on watch on the bridge saw dark clouds approaching, and it soon started to rain heavily. The watchman was sent to inform the crew of the rain. Two men were sent on deck to close the tank lids. Many of the tanks were almost in load-ready condition, and it was important that they did not get rainwater inside. The two men hurried from lid to lid, swinging them over and throwing the securing dogs on, with a few quick turns to each. The rain eventually passed, and the pumpman went out to once again check the tanks. He was halfway through tightening the dogs on number five centre tank lid, when he heard a faint knocking coming from inside the tank. He immediately opened the lid back up, and found the chief officer clinging onto the ladder, breathing heavily. He had one safety shoe in his hand, and was weakly banging at the inside of the tank hatch. Luckily. He was only suffering from shock and fatigue. Failure to observe basic enclosed space entry procedures and the independent actions of the chief officer primarily led to this near miss incident. The gas carrier Happy Falcon, of 3,366 gross registered tons, arrived alongside in Zeebrugge, Belgium, early on the 10th of January 2003. And commenced preparations for inerting and gas-freeing operations. The nitrogen was being supplied by a shoreside contractor. The ship was to load a full cargo of propylene in her two tanks. Number one tank had previously been loaded with raffinate one, and required inerting with nitrogen to below the lower explosive limit, and then gas-freeing. The tank was then to be inspected, and if accepted by the surveyor. Purged again with nitrogen prior to loading. Number two tank had previously contained propylene, and did not require inspection or purging. At 0145 hours, prior to inerting number one tank, readings of the atmosphere in the tank were taken, and gas concentrations of 5.7 percent at the top, 5.2 percent in the middle, and 3.7 percent at the bottom were observed. Hoses were connected at 0205 hours. And the tank was depressurized to shore. This was completed at 0335 hours, and nitrogen was started into the tank at 0340 hours. Nitrogen was being supplied into the top of the tank, with the gas vapor being expelled out through the liquid line in the bottom of the tank and to a flare on shore. Readings were taken at intervals, showing a progressive drop in the gas concentration. At 08:30 hours, nitrogen was stopped, and the tank dome lid was opened in preparation for inserting the shore ventilation hose. The chief officer, third officer, and an AB were attending to this task. The AB on the jetty, the third officer pulling the hose towards the tank lid, and the chief officer guiding it into position at the lid. The third officer was facing out towards the ship's side rail as he was working. And was not aware of the activity actually taking place at the tank lid. He heard a noise and turned around, but could not see the chief officer. He moved towards the dome and looked down into the tank, where he saw the chief officer lying on the middle platform of the ladder, halfway down into the tank. The third officer ran into the accommodation, raised the alarm, shouted to the personnel present in the mess room, telephoned the bridge. And made a broadcast on the PA system before returning to the deck. It was 0851 hours.
the AB returned on board and prepared to enter the tank with a safety line. The shore supervisor also climbed on board and warned the AB not to enter without breathing apparatus. Personnel and equipment were arriving on site, however, and the AB donned a self-contained breathing apparatus and entered the tank. The shore supervisor raised the alarm on shore and called the emergency services. At approximately 08.55 hours, the chief officer, supported by the AB from underneath, was lifted using the safety line and manhandled out onto deck. The second officer commenced administering oxygen, and it was noted that the chief officer was still breathing. At this time, however, a noise was heard from inside the tank, and it was found that the AB had himself fallen and was lying on the same middle platform that the chief officer had been rescued from. An OS and the messman now donned breathing apparatus and entered the tank with a safety line. The AB was retrieved to deck at 0900 hours, but found not to be breathing or to have a pulse. Efforts continued to revive him until an ambulance arrived and took both the chief officer and AB to hospital. The AB was declared dead some hours later, when the life support machine to which he had been connected on arrival was finally switched off. The chief officer partially recovered and was repatriated to the Philippines. It has never been conclusively established whether the chief officer actually climbed into the tank to position the ventilation hose, fell into the tank from deck, or slipped and fell from a position at or near the top of the tank. Given the limited size of the access hatch and the injuries he sustained, the third possibility is considered more likely. The rapid and efficient action of the third officer and the AB undoubtedly saved the life of the chief officer. How the AB came to fall is unknown, but it is believed to be either due to the face mask of the breathing apparatus being knocked off during the removal of the chief officer, or due to him slipping during the same phase of the recovery and being overcome in the nitrogen-rich atmosphere within the tank. A superintendent was visiting a vessel to carry out an annual inspection. As part of the inspection, he was to enter and examine the condition of the ballast tanks. The vessel had a double skin, and the ballast tanks extended from the double bottom around and up the sides of the ship. All had a centerline division, thus creating port and starboard tanks. Access was achieved through manhole covers on the main deck, close to the ship's side. The ship's management team were prepared for the inspection and the chief officer had emptied and ventilated a number of tanks prior to arrival alongside. Enclosed space entry procedures, as detailed in the company safety management system, were being satisfactorily followed. The superintendent entered a number three starboard ballast tank, accompanied by the deck cadet. An AB was detailed as watchman at the after manhole cover and a mechanical, air-driven ventilation fan was running on the forward manhole cover. Both the superintendent and the deck cadet were carrying portable flashlights, and the deck cadet had a portable radio, which put him in contact with both the officer of the watch and the chief officer. The superintendent also carried a camera, which he was using to make a photographic record of the inspection. The vessel had recently landed moderately heavily against the corner of a berth, and there was an indentation in the shell plating in this tank, as well as a damaged stiffener. The two men descended vertically part way down the tank, and then moved forward along a longitudinal stringer to the location of the damage, quite close to the forward bulkhead, which divided number three starboard ballast tank from number two starboard directly forward. There was some noise from the fan above, which also blocked out any additional light that might have been available through the open forward manhole cover. The restricted width of the space meant that the two men had to move in file, the superintendent leading. When they reached the indentation, the superintendent brought out his camera and took a few shots from aft, holding the flashlight and camera together and playing the light beam onto the damaged area. He then turned handed his flashlight to the deck cadet and instructed him to direct the beams from both flashlights in a similar manner, while he took a few more pictures.
The superintendent then moved a couple of meters forward, all the time facing aft, until he was ahead of the damage. He raised the camera to his eye and framed his picture. He could not quite include all the detail he needed, so he eased his way further forward. At this point, he fell backwards through a lightning hole in the stringer. He managed to catch himself as he fell, but suffered three fractured ribs, bruising, and cuts to both shins and forearms, and severe shock. Neither man had seen the danger, as the flashlights were being used to highlight the area of damage. The superintendent was moving backwards and was between the deck cadet and the lightning hole, thus obscuring any view that he might have had. The nature of the space meant that it was impractical to rig any kind of defensive barrier around every hole in every stringer, but the superintendent should have been alert to the dangers presented by the structure. This sixty-eight thousand deadweight tons bulk carrier. Was loaded with a cargo of petroleum coke, otherwise known as pet coke. The holes of the vessel were accessed down vertical ladders at each end of the compartment. When she arrived in port for discharge, the ship was boarded by a young surveyor, who told the chief officer in conversation while they were completing the paperwork that he was on his first job alone, without a senior surveyor supervising his work. He explained that his instructions called for samples from each hold. The hatches were still closed as the vessel came alongside, and the crew commenced opening them, working from forward. But it seemed to be taking longer than usual. The chief officer left the surveyor in the ship's office and went on deck to try and speed up the process. The surveyor decided to start taking his samples and went on deck himself. As there appeared to be a problem with the hatch forward, he decided to start at the aft hold. He released the securing dogs on the starboard side at the aft end of number eight hold, and opened the lid. He then lowered his sampling gear inside the trunk, and climbed inside, leaving his notebook and baseball cap on a frame nearby. Some minutes later, the deck cadet, passing down the same side of the deck, spotted the cap and book, and paused to investigate. He then spotted the open hatch and looked inside. He could just make out the heel of a boot under the edge of a frame in the beam of his flashlight. The deck cadet ran out to the side of the ship and jumped up and down, waving his arms and shouting until he gained the attention of a sailor forward. Then ran back to the hatch. He then evidently entered the hold himself in an attempt to reach the man inside. The sailor forward, who had seen the deck cadet, had in the meantime run aft and quickly appraised the situation. Luckily, a second sailor arrived shortly behind him, and this man had a radio and raised the alarm. One man then stayed by the hatch, and the other went to the safety locker on the poop deck to get a self-contained breathing apparatus. The chief officer was next to arrive on scene, followed almost immediately by the third officer. The chief officer put his leg over the combing of the hatch and made to climb straight down into the hold as well. The third officer reminded him of the likely dangers of the atmosphere inside the hole, but he swung his other leg over onto the top of the ladder as well. The third officer then shouted at the chief officer, and an argument ensued, with the third officer actually grasping the chief officer around the neck, and the chief officer striking out at the third officer in return. The two of them, by now, shouting continuously at each other. At this stage, the master arrived at the hatch. And immediately ordered the chief officer to climb back out of the hatch. The deck cadet was seen to be in a sitting position on the surface of the cargo, with his back against the access ladder, but not moving. Rescue equipment and more personnel had now started to arrive, and the third officer and second engineer donned self-contained breathing apparatus and climbed down the ladder. Two of the crew, under direction of the master, opened the hatch. When the rescue team reached the deck cadet, he was seen to have vomited and was semi-conscious, but clearly still alive. The surveyor was either unconscious or dead. Within minutes, the two were lifted back up to the deck. The alarm had also been raised on shore, and a medical team from the installation was soon on board. The surveyor was confirmed as dead at the scene, and the deck cadet was transferred to hospital 
where, over the next few days, he made a steady recovery. The surveyor succumbed to the lack of oxygen and presence of fumes in the hold, and the deck cadet almost suffered an identical fate. The clear thinking and determination of the third officer in restraining the chief officer, despite his seniority, undoubtedly prevented a third casualty. This example involves a general cargo vessel with a conventional four-peak tank and collision bulkhead. A sluice gate valve is mounted inside the four-peak tank with a transmission to the forecastle deck. Due to a misalignment in the transmission rods to the deck, this arrangement failed and the coupling broke off, making it impossible to empty the tank in the normal way. It was decided to contract a shoreside firm with suitable equipment at the next port of call to empty the four-peak tank and carry out the necessary repairs. This happened to be in a tropical area with high humidity. A portable, air-driven, deep well pump was to be lowered into the four-peak tank through the manhole. The pump was to be driven by an air compressor, itself driven by a separate diesel generator located on the quayside adjacent to the forecastle, set up and tended by the contractor. When the tank was partially emptied, the pump had to be relocated lower down in the tank, being manoeuvred past one of the internal stringer plates. One of the fitters entered the tank, believing that fresh air was being drawn in from outside as the tank was deballasted. Shortly after entering the forepeak and descending to the stringer plate, he was seen to sit down, then slump forward, with his back to the bulkhead and adjacent to the ladder. The alarm was raised and a rescue party assembled. The compressor was stopped and deballasting halted. As the temperature and humidity at the time of the incident were both extremely high and the fitter was somewhat elderly, the rescue team initially suspected that the man had simply attempted too much. The chief officer therefore entered the tank without a breathing apparatus to assist the fitter. He reached the man and fitted him into a safety harness that had been lowered from above. As the team outside began to pull, he guided the semi-conscious fitter through the manhole. As he exited himself, however, he was conscious of a nauseous sensation and severe headache, such that he too required assistance. Both men were taken to hospital, but returned to the ship later in the day. Subsequent investigation and analysis revealed that both sludge and rust in the forepeak were minimal. However, it was noted that the compressor and generator had been arranged facing each other on a flatbed trailer parked in the lee of the forecastle. There was no wind, and, in effect, the intake of the compressor was directly in line with the exhaust outlet of the diesel generator. With each stroke of the pump inside the forepeak, contaminated air was being added to the atmosphere. No meter readings were taken, either prior to or following the entry, so the theory remains unproven, but is considered to be the most likely cause of the problem. Either way, both men were lucky to escape from what was undoubtedly a hazardous atmosphere.